Howdy, Jacob here. Today we're looking at H&R Block. Let's remember to do our taxes soon. We got a little over a month left. You're welcome. All right. Anyways, diversified consumer services industry. I mean, it's really just a two-player here. You got your TurboTax, your H&R Block. I think any other service for tax purposes is not really well known. Uh, headquartered in Kansas City in 1955, founded. Very interesting. You're not going to be looking at a lot of growth here. You can see $3 billion in 2014 and $3.5 billion in 2023. Very little growth, which makes sense. They've been around since 1955. They do taxes. I mean, I'm sure they do other things, but I just, yeah, again, just don't expect a whole lot of growth if we're getting in here. Interestingly enough, or surprising enough, gross margin is up 5%, but their operating margin is down 5%. So usually when you have moat businesses, I mean, they, they would both be increasing, but um, the operating margin absolutely would be increasing due to the fact that you could sell things at higher variations from the cost that it took to create them. So that's interesting to see that. Return on invested capital has always looked extremely substantial, but keep in mind that when you repurchase shares, it inflates your return on invested capital due to it being calculated off a book, uh, due to it being calculated off the balance sheet. So if you're looking for share repurchases, by golly, this could be the company. I mean, 274 million in 2014, down to 154 million in 2023. You're nearly cut in half over a 10-year period. So that's going to be a great use of giving money back to the shareholders as long as it's bought at cheap prices. Absolute asterisk there. It has to be bought at cheap prices for it to be a great green, uh, investment for your shareholders. About a billion cash on hand, $1.5 billion long-term debt, no short-term debt. Pretty safe balance sheet. Not too concerned with that. Especially because their five-year free cash flow is probably about six hundred million, and that six hundred million is just over two years of their long-term debt. And again, they have a billion in cash to uh, force comes to worse as well. So, use of cash a little bit on the acquisition side looks like maybe what is that ten percent? Not even ten percent to acquisitions. So a little under ten percent to acquisitions to their debt repayment. Recently, they've been buying back some debt. The dividend is nothing. I mean, they're paying out 30% of their five-year average free cash flow on a dividend, and it's a 2.6% yield. So I guess it makes sense why they're buying back shares. So the company's buying back a lot of shares recently. They are at a 13 PE. And it looks like they've jumped pretty substantially over the last five years. So at one point, it was probably close to a eight or under PE. So it makes sense whether they were buying back shares down there. Uh, be interesting to see what they're doing right now. But for now, I'm, I think I'm ready to make some assumptions on the revenue exchange side. I mean, we're not looking at much growth here. But again, with consistency, people love consistency. And outside of COVID, you're looking at a very consistent business. So I'm going to say revenue growth, probably 2%, and then a 14 on the P and price free cash flow, just because I'd say that it should be a little bit less than market because their growth is a little bit less, and then their reinvestment opportunities aren't that great. They're just repurchasing a bunch of shares. And we can see that with a market cap of about $7 billion, 1% would cost them about 70 million right now. And so five times that 350 million, I think they can afford 350 million. So let's say they buy back 5% of shares. And again, the share change is just an assumption here. There could be other uses of cash that they do, but um, to me, companies are fairly consistent with what they do in free cash flow. And as you can see here, this is gonna be their main use of it. But obviously, if the price goes up and doubles and triples tomorrow or the next year, you might not want them to be repurchasing shares. So this is also assuming that the history um, doesn't necessarily 
repeat itself, but is closer to history. And that's why, again, we be conservative with our estimations. And then because they're buying back so much, so many shares, this aggregate fall sequel would go down in dividend. So that's why I'm going to assume that they can probably afford a 5% increase in dividend. Because again, if they're buying back 5% of shares, they can increase their dividend 5%. Again, fake math, but uh, keeps their aggregate relatively flat. Margin side, let's go pretty much average here. 15, 17. Let's do it. 15, 17. And yeah, we're really not too far off, which makes sense. I feel like I looked at this company when it was sub 30 and got pretty excited about it. So again, this is, people might bring a value trap, this, that, and the other. Value trap is just being incorrect on your assumptions. So it's not, it's not a diss or a brag or anything that you can think of. It's just, if you're wrong about present value, then you're going to be wrong in the return you'd estimated on your stock. So a value trap is just being incorrect about calculating your present value. And again, that's not saying in the short term anything because in the short term anything can happen. But if you are if you make great assumptions and the assumptions come to fruition uh, or the business plays out similar to your assumptions, your return should be close to your expectation because in the long run uh, it, it in the long run stocks are voting or in the short run it's a voting machine in the long run it's a weighing machine so it's it's just the price of the uh, the true price of the business will show in the long term so hopefully you enjoy the video we have to show slow growth stock current or a slow growth company to uh, review today but those share repurchases are pretty crazy so yeah have a good one Bye.